Good morning. I'm John Jones, Chairman of the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority. This meeting is being conducted pursuant to the notice provisions of the Oklahoma Open Meeting Act, with all participating authority members attending in person. <clears throat> While this meeting is open in public, there will be no public comments, as is OTA's longstanding historical practice. In addition to being open to the public, for in-person observation, the meeting is being live streamed and recorded for remote viewing. The time is 10.04, and I'm calling the November 7th, 2023 regular meeting of the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority to order. Jenny, please call the roll. Mr. Will Berry? Here. Mr. Todd Cohn? Here. Mr. Gene Love? Here. Mr. John Titsworth? Here. Ms. Dana Weber? Here. Mr. John Jones? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Our first item this morning is recognition and awards. Secretary Gatz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. The OTA joined Kansas, Florida, and Texas uh, in their tolling authorities on the winner's podium for the 2023 IBTTA Toll Excellence Award in Customer Service and Marketing Outreach. Uh, this is something we're pretty excited about. Uh, the award was presented at IBTTA's annual conference in Seattle for the Hub to Hub Interoperability Project undertaken by members of the Southeast United States Region Hub and the Central United States Region Hub. This first in the nation, first in the nation, and you hear a lot of discussion about interoperability, uh, this is a big deal for the country. Uh, this project demonstrates the need for national interoperability among tolling authorities. The uh, project improves the customer experience and increases operational efficiencies in part by creating that regional hub custodian. So that this is joining together uh, with other turnpikes that have already created their own hubs. Uh, we've established that single point of contact between the regions that now allows seamless tolling, customer service for the central U.S. and the southeast U.S. regional hubs and helps travelers in Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, and Florida. So we've got a, a video, I think, that we're going to roll. The 2023 IBTTA Toll Excellence Award recognizes the historic launch of the Central and Southeast Hub-to-Hub -hub Connection. The Central Hub, comprised of agencies in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, along with the Southeast Hub, which includes Florida's Turnpike Enterprise and other tolling agencies, have proudly developed the nation's first regional hub-to-hub -hub interoperability blueprint. By connecting two U.S. regional hubs for centralized toll processing, using national interoperability standards for financial, communication, technical infrastructure, and customer service, they have demonstrated incredible value and benefit to customers and agencies. Through extensive testing, the hub to hub connection broke new ground with the integration of multi-protocol transponders and roadside readers, and innovation successfully achieved with partner agencies in four states. Connectivity between the Central and Southeast Regional Hubs launched on February 27, 2023, allowing customers seamless payment for toll travel between four states. Teams from both regions work tirelessly together to ensure the project's success, testing and retesting to go live without incident. In immediate success, there were over 800,000 transactions in the first 60 days, far exceeding forecasted traffic volume. This implementation required financial, technical, legal, communications, and customer service teams from multiple agencies across four states to collaborate, ensuring a positive, convenient, and cost-effective customer experience. Hundreds of hours were invested to make this program successful, and this recognition is truly valued. With the continued leadership of the IBTTA and others, the success of the Central and Southeast hub-to-hub -hub connection demonstrates the unique character of each tolling agency is not a barrier to interoperability success. This model exemplifies innovation, service, safety, teamwork, and efficiency for the future of the tolling industry, bringing us one step closer to achieving national interoperability.
And I stand here today uh, being very thankful for the team of professionals that Oklahoma has working for the Turnpike Authority uh, and being very proud of the work that they've done. Uh, I will tell you without hesitation, Oklahoma has carried the Central Hub initiative and we've made that interoperability with Kansas and Texas uh, everything that it is today. And we are so fortunate to have that. Joining with the Southeast Hub was not an easy thing to make happen. The, the intricacies and the moving parts that have to happen in the back offices of these organizations uh, are daunting at best. And uh, our team has made this look pretty easy uh, through very hard work, long hours, and diligence. And at this point, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I would like to call the Oklahoma team forward and uh, have a little bit of a photo op here with them. Uh, if you'd stand at your, at your chairs, we'll, uh, we'll have them down front here and, and uh, take a picture in celebration of this significant award. Please do. Team. Jim, on behalf of the board, we uh, congratulate you all on this honor. It's uh, very well deserved, and you and your team uh, and staff did a great job. All right. Next item of business is the approval of minutes for the regular meeting of October 3rd, 2023. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. By the second. 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 Second by Mr. Love. Jenny, please call for the vote. Oh, we're doing the electronic. Pardon? Pardon me. Old habit. Did we get all the votes registered? Got it. Good. <clears throat> the approval of minutes passed. Now on to the next items of business. Budget items, Mr. Cohn. First two items, 1118 and 1119, Ms. Wendy. All right. Um, I'm <coughs> waiting for something to go up on the screen. Um, they about to do that. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, first off, we got the budget. I'm super excited. And I wanted to start out by thanking Dania and Jonna for all their hard work on the preliminary annual budget. They worked so hard and I'm so proud of them because we had to work through new software. So that leads me to wanting to thank Joni for getting us through that new software. Um, and it just seemed to just go so effortlessly. So anyway, um, I also have to give a shout out to Patrice who used to do this whole thing by herself with a terrible software. And I just have no idea how she did it. So, and um, obviously thanks to all the division managers uh, for their patience and their hard work on their budgets as well. So. Before we get to the nuts and bolts of the projected operating and maintenance expenses, I would like to start with the 2024 budgeted flow of funds, and that's um, right there. Um, we kind of went through this in June, but I figured I would, you know, start there so we could kind of look at us overall, not just as an O and M. You know, we also have all of all of these other all of these other funds. So. This flow matches exactly what we talked about in June, other than it's updated for the 2024 numbers. And as I explained at the time, 
Um, the 507 transfer is a staple of the trustee report each month, and it's, it establishes our flow of funds in our trust indenture for which we must comply. So we start out by we de the deposit revenues from operations into the revenue fund on a daily basis, and at the end of the month, the excess after expenditures from O&M are then dis deposited to various funds. So that first transfer <coughs> is the authority's first priority, transferring the funds to the bond service accounts for paying the bond principal and interest. Um, the authority also has a debt service reserve fund that's equal to one year principal and interest if, if it was uh, it had a deficiency would need to be replenished. However, right now it's just slightly overfunded. Uh, then there's a transfer made to the reserve maintenance fund, an amount set by the authority's consulting engineer, and um, for the purpose of paying certain maintenance expenses to keep the turnpike system in good repair, and you can see that's 43248 million. Uh, the excess balance goes to the general fund, so that general fund money plus the reserve maintenance fund are the two major funding sources of the capital plan, which is also contained in the budget. That's about 100.3 million. Those two numbers added together add up to 106. So. We didn't take all of that, but we have some other things that we're paying for. Um, all of the money that's left goes back into the roads, so uh, we're not profit driven. So after we make all of these payments, um, I wanted to point this out because this graphic represents a fundament the fundamental basis for how the rating agencies and investors view the authority. This is what they're really looking for, and if you can see on the bottom, it shows our two ra our two ratios, those are, the, especially the 1.77, that is the one that the rating agencies look at. They like to see that in the one, in the one sevens. That's what keeps us at our double A minus rating. The one below is one that is trust required, and that's a much more difficult rating to meet and very unique to our entity that takes into account the reserve maintenance, and then they make us do 105% of debt on top of that. So we're at 1.30, we only have to be at 1.0, so I'm pretty excited about that. So <laughs> that top square represents the pro projected total revenues, um, and that includes toll revenues, investment income, miscellaneous revenues, and concession revenues. The projections of toll revenues are performed by the authority's traffic engineer, CDM Smith. They just finished the first comprehensive traffic and revenue study since the pandemic. The previous comprehensive study had been done in conjunction with the Driving Forward program in 2018. And after a, tough, a very tough 2020, where revenues dropped as much as 33% in a single month after that, the, the, the devastating effects of COVID hitting the global economy, it became obvious in 2021 that we needed to reset and do another comprehensive TNR study. But once access was added in there, that delayed the study a bit because then we had to put in, you know, what kind of effects that would have on the system. Um, the TNR was completed in October and was used in conjunction with the first bond financing that the authority did for access. And although 2020, I wanted to point this out because I thought this was amazing. Although 2020 was tough with a drop in toll revenues of 27 million as compared to the 2018 TNR, OTA continued to outpace those original projections for 2021, 2022, and 2023, showing what Moody's has always said, that we're one of the fastest entities in their portfolio to recover from the effects of the pandemic. That was attributed not only to the location of I-44 in the middle of the country, but also the governor's handling of the state during that challenging time, as well as Moody's view of the authority's history of good management. So I really wanted to point that out. So speaking of good management, I'm happy to present this budget, the operating budget, for your consideration. Staff worked really hard to pull together their budgetary needs for 2024 to ensure that we can continue to operate the facilities both safely and efficiently. This year's budget comes in at $155.8 million, an increase of just over $18 million, and it results in a 13.08% increase. So some of the significant categories include the Oklahoma P Highway Patrol is set to graduate its newest cadets, and the authority is so excited we're going to receive a net increase of 16 much-needed troopers to its system. These additional troopers will provide patrolling and policing of the turnpikes, enforcing laws, regulating and directing the movement of traffic, <coughs> assisting the citizens and motoring public, along with cooperating with law enforcement officers and public officials throughout the state. The approximate increase to the budget for, these much needed, for this much-needed addition is $2.7 million. We're really excited about that especially with having added the new roads during driving forward. So speaking of safety, the authority is also working diligent to complete its conversion of its toll roads to cashless tolling. As of today, all three of those turnpikes, all but three of the turnpikes have been conver converted. Those include the Turner Turnpike, the Will Rogers Turnpike, and the Indian, Indian Nation. Cash seems to be becoming more and more obsolete. The Will Rogers Airport doesn't take cash anymore, and Paycom Center that hosts the Oklahoma Thunder and Concert events also doesn't take cash, so I think that we're just falling in line with everybody else. 
Converting to cashless creates a much safer travel environment for the authority's patrons. Existing cash toll plazas on the Turnpike Network represent the primary safety concern and introduce three points of conflict, including exiting from the main line to pay the toll, the stop condition to pay the toll, and the reentry to the main line. Cashless tolling eliminates these points of potential conflict and allows the OTA to enhance the safety of all Turnpike patrons while also offering the convenience of true open road tolling for non-Pike Pass customers. Existing toll plazas, especially at interchanges, can be reconfigured through traffic operational improvements with a focus on safety, and patrons can pay their toll at a time convenient for them as opposed to digging for change in a live traffic situation. So a cashless system with both transponder and video payment types allows OTA to toll their regular customers using Pike Pass transponder as well as occasional customers using what we call the plate pay system. The license plates photographed and a bill is sent to the registered owner or license plate customers are called plate pay customers. Along with reconfiguring the current toll plazas for safety, a new toll, a new cashless tolling system eliminates the need to spend millions of dollars on traditional toll plazas, which historically in the past had included infrastructure such as toll booths, small offices, bathrooms, break rooms for employees. So as we eliminate those future capital expenditures, we also are having to increase our O&M, particularly while we're making th this transition. Some of these increases in include higher postage, printing, license plate lookup costs, as well as bank service charges having <coughs> increased as more and more customers are invoiced on the turnpike system as we convert those last three turnpikes by year end 2024. Also, and these also happen to be the ones that have the most dollars associated with them. Also, in order to help with converting Pike Pass customers to Pike Pass, we've increased the marketing budget to assist in that endeavor. Those categories that I just listed increase to about $6.7 million. We continue to work to convert PlayPay customers to Pike Pass to attempt to mitigate these costs, and Marcus's customer service reps have been highly successful, successful in that endeavor, converting over 50% of those people that call in, converting them to a Pike Pass. That leads to a budget for an increased customer representative presence on our system. The customer service center is requesting an additional, an additional 45 service reps with a price tag of approximately $3.7 million to be hired over the course of next year in order to keep up with increased wait times and uh, on the phones. As you may or may not know, our Office of Customer Service achieved a remarkable milestone by receiving just under 109,000 calls in the month of August. This is the first time since the call center's inception that they reached the $100,000 mark, and it is truly an outstanding accomplishment. Management will continue to monitor the applicable KPIs in order to make the decisions related to the timing of the additional hiring of customer services representatives and when they'll come on. Other increases attributed to cashless tolling include about $1.7 million for a reorganization of personnel. This budget includes a request for an additional 11 positions that will be responsible for the more complicated revenue collection process of cashless tolling. Two new divisions have been created, business operations and revenue assurance to handle these processes. Patrice, who I mentioned earlier, who was so great at the budget, has taken over business operations. Mary is with re revenue assurance. There are also increases related to interoperability. You just saw that great film short about about the interoperability and how well we're doing and how really involved our agency is in that process. So there are also increased uh, interoperable fees that we pay other agencies, but those are ops offset by the increased interoperable fees that we actually collect that's included in our miscellaneous revenue that's in that very first square that I pointed out earlier. Also, along with that, anticipated expenses of just under 300000 to integrate with future partners are also anticipated in this budget. We want to make sure that we can continue to do that. That keeps more and more people out of plate pay as well. Because we are unsure as to when those remaining three turnpikes will convert, we have budgeted for the cash tolling staff through the end of 2024 in the event we do not convert until year end. So we, we realize this budget looks big. Part of that is because we're budgeting for both uh, cash models for both models of collection. So we fully expect by the end of next year we won't have any cash collectors anymore. We should see some savings in that next budget. With all those increases related to cashless toiling, I should point out that the authority has saved budgeted dollars of approximately $2.7 million in a reduction in its cost of pipe pass tags and also has decreased its expenses related to armored car services because we're not having to go out and pick up, pick up cash along the system. So the increase to the budget related to just cashless tolling with those decreases in there comes to approximately 9.9 .9 million or 7.2% of that overall 13.8. So to complete the explanation of increases to the operating and maintenance budget, we can't avoid talking about inflation. 
We've all seen it in the news, and as we are all aware, inflation took quite a toll, no pun intended, on the nation's businesses throughout 2023, and the authority is absolutely no exception. The authority has seen increases in utilities, postage rates, and the authority's contract with Transcor. These increases amounted to just over 750,000. Road maintenance costs include, including asphalt, concrete, drainage contracts, and contracts like mowing and sweeping that are comp competitively, competitively bid with the additional increased vehicle and equipment repairs that the highway patrol and maintenance budget have to sustain due to supply cha chain disruptions have increased budget expenses by just another, just under another $800,000. With unprecedented low employment, unemployment, attracting qualified applicants and retaining good employees is imperative for the authority. This, uh, to, to that end, the authority did market adjustments for two hard to fill job classifications. The first was a reclassification of transportation equipment operators to heavy transportation equipment operators. This change increased the projected budget by approximately $1.3 million. The authority also did a market adjustment for customer service representatives, which resulted in an increase to the projected budget of approximately $3.2 million. The final addition to the budget in the category of inflation was approximately $6.1 million, or 4.1% of the overall budget. And finally, we had a couple of decreases due to our superior safety program and successfully reducing accidents. We have seen budgeted workers' compensation premiums drop by approximately $200,000. Along with that, we've also cut our fuel budget by approximately $500,000 with the realization that we really did over budget last year. That's an, a reduction of about 0.52%. So again, management and staff worked very diligently on their budget to ensure that we can operate the Turnpike Authority both safely and efficiently, and I'll take any questions that you might have. The first thing is kudos to you and your team. You've done a Thank fantastic you. job. And the fact that you're being such good stewards has allowed us to keep our tolls down where they otherwise would have been much, right. high, much higher. But thank you to your team. Any other questions? Just another comment. Uh, kudos to Marcus and his team. If they're converting uh, plate pay customers, uh, you know, cash customers to Pike Pass at the rate of 50%, that's, that's pretty incredible. So. Marcus, uh, thanks to you and all your team. Well, and that's a win-win. It keeps our cost to collect down, sure. but it also gets them a lower toll. And that's why we spend money on marketing, too. What's the good in having a program if nobody knows about it? So, One other comment, that is that it, I wasn't clear from your comments, but I think it's important for people to know that you not only um, are putting a budget together, but it really is almost a zero-based budget. You know, just take last year's and make changes to it. You go back and look at everything, which is why you're able to make some decreases as well right. as increases in your budget. Exactly. We always look at everything. We look at what we actually need, and then we take a look, and we have to make hard choices sometimes. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, based upon the presentation and the recommendation of staff, I would move for approval of the budget for um, next calendar year, item 1118. We have a motion for <coughs> approval. Do we have a second? Second. Thanks, Ms. Weber. Um, please vote at the appropriate time on the screen. That uh, item was approved. Next item is 1119, Ms. Smith, and this is the Gilcrease budget. Still got me up here. Okay. <coughs> so this is the second year that we have presented a Gilcrease budget for your consideration. And as you are aware, the Gilcrease is a non-system project because it stands on its own and does not benefit from the cross-pledging of the Turnpike system. This process for setting up a budget was negotiated during the TIFIA loan process with the federal government and TIFIA itself. So the expenses for the Gilcrease are paid from the general fund. There is a line item for this amount showing in the capital plan for 2024 that matches this number, 1162656. So you'll also see a line item for the $4 million Gilcrease Annual Project Assistant contribution, and that should appear on your agenda in early 2024. That is another part of that um, negotiation with <coughs> TIFIA. The, and there are certain circumstances that we have to either give $4 million or $1 million, um, and so right now we're still in that $4 million stage as the toll road has almost, we're like a week away from it having been opened for a whole year. So we're excited about that. So this budget includes toll collection, which is charged on a direct cost basis for such things as um, in manual image review, postage, and AVI operations. Maintenance is charged on a direct cost basis as well, with highway patrol and overhead being charged on a per mile basis. At the end of each six-month period, staff will ascertain actual expenses for the Gilcrease, and the Turnpike system is reimbursed accordingly under certain conditions for expenses under budget. And we have actually made that request for the first half of the year and actually um, 
bought money back from the Gilcrease. Attached is a monthly schedule similar to how the reserve maintenance is handled for the turnpike system where we put in um, a certain amount per month for them to pay for their their O&M uh, and I'll, I'm recommending approval. Staff's recommending approval. Um, I'll take any questions. Are there any questions? Well, I'm looking forward to a North Gilcrease budget to be <laughs> pre-approved on this. <laughs> but, based upon the recommendation of the, of the staff and for approval, I'd uh, move for approval of item 1119, which is the Gilcrease um, budget. We have a motion for approval of item 1119. Do we have a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. Love. Please vote at the appropriate time on the touch screen. <coughs> Voting is ended and that item has been approved. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wendy. Next item is 1120, Brian Jepson. Chairman Jones, members of the authority, for your consideration today, I have the fiscal year 2024 workers' <coughs> compensation premium. Um, and the amount, the amount that was originally recommended by the actuary was actually $431,000, um, which is an increase of over $120,000. However, the Office of Management and Enterprise Services capped that increase at 10%, making the premium $342,392.73. This is a 28.5% decrease from the premium recommended by the actuary. And while this is an increase for 2024, it is $32,000 less than the FY22 amount. So happy to answer any questions. Any questions? No, it's good to see premiums go down. Yep. Mr. Chairman, based upon the recommendation of the staff, I would move for um, approval of item 1120 as presented. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. We have a, <coughs> a motion for approval of item 1120. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Please vote at the appropriate time on the touch screen. Voting is in, ended, and item 1120 is passed. Next one is item 1121, Mark Mann. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Submitted for consideration and approval of the authority is a request to authorize the director to negotiate and execute a contract with TokenX for credit card tokenization services. If approved, the agreement will conform to the terms and conditions of the contained in the TokenX statewide contract solicitation number SW1050 for a three-year term at the annual amount of $200,110 for a total dollar amount not to exceed $600,330. The OTA staff has reviewed the above item and recommends approval. Are there any questions? If not, Mr. Chairman, um, I would move for approval of item 1121 as presented based upon the recommendation of staff. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. We have a motion for approval of item 1121. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Berry. Please vote at the appropriate time on the touch screen. <coughs> Voting is end ended, and Thank item you. 1121 is passed. Ms. Patrice Williams. <coughs> Good morning. Um, I am here to seek approval for the board to authorize the director to negotiate and um, execute an amendment with Questmark, the postage and printing services for the upcoming 2024 20, year. I previously mentioned um, our organization is continuously evaluating our business practices to establish a more efficient vendor uh, management process. In line with our goals um, to streamline processes, we will solicit an RFP for postage printing and transponder fulfillment in late 2024, aimed at enhancing occupation, excuse me, operational efficiency and cost effectiveness. In 2024, we will see significant growth with a transition from to cashless on the remaining three turnpikes, which includes two of our largest turnpikes, as Wendy has stated. Um, in this transition, will lead to an increased plate pay and pike pass uh, usage resulting in an estimated 18% increase in postage and printing for the 2020, uh, 2024 upcoming year. So it is important to note that the assessment of our expected volume um, trends will, will have an uptick, but as we continue and get to about 13 months after our last term bike is converted, 
13 months, we'll have a better view of what our tra traffic will look like, what postage and printing will look like, so we'll be better to come back and give a better analysis and information. Um, so um, staff has carefully reviewed this and seek approval. And I can answer any questions that you may have. Are there any questions? If there are none, then Mr. Chairman, I would move for approval of 1122 as presented based upon the recommendation of staff. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. We have a <clears throat> motion for approval of item 1122. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Love. Please vote at the appropriate time. Uh, item 1122 uh, has passed. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, just for the record, I think when I uh, when we voted on the budget, I accidentally pushed the wrong button. No, I want the record to show that I vote yes on approving the budget. Jen, can know, you please? I don't know how we change that, but can we look at making that amendment? We, we can reflect that in the minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, <clears throat> Ms. Patterson. Good morning, Chairman Jones and members of the authority. <coughs> Item number 1123 is the payment register prepared by the Comptroller Division. This payment register includes all payments made in the month of September 2023. The staff has reviewed this item and recommends this item for approval. Any questions? We were all given copies of this and based upon the recommendation of staff. Mr. Chairman, I would recommend approval of item 1123. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. We have a motion for approval of item 1123. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Please vote at the appropriate time. Item 1123 has been approved. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. Next items are from the engineering and construction uh, items. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman Will Berry. Thank you, Chairman Jones. First item is item 1124, will be presented by Mrs. Nelson. Good morning, Chairman Jones, members of the authority, Secretary Gatz. Today I'm presenting one item 1124 on behalf of Construction Division. Submitted are eight above items for your consideration of approval. The first item we have is for uh, project CMC 29 slash CKTMC 23. This is the AT conversion on the Cimarron Turnpike, as well as the 11th Street ramps in Tulsa. The contractor is Manhattan Road and Bridge. This is for supplemental agreement number six for the agreed amount of $71,689.50. This change order adds three new items to the contract. The removal of a drying basin was necessary in order to construct a planned roadway ditch. Two additional impact attenuators were necessary to protect the retaining wall blunt ends. These attenuators were inadvertently omitted from the plans and were not accounted for at the time of bid. Warning, light, warning lights type A were added to the contract as they were a required traffic control component by the MUTCD standards. Next, we have EOC 2463. This is the interchange at Northeast 23rd Street. The contractor is Allen Contracting. This is for uh, change order number seven for the agreed amount of $23,771.12. This change order establishes the final quantity for items on the original contract and those items added by supplemental agreement that deviated from the original quantity. Deductions or other adjustments associated with this contract will be identified in the final estimate. This change order also provides the Excuse me. This change order also provides for the unrecoverable expenses and lost overhead incurred by the contractor due to the deletion of a major pay item for turf reinforcement mat as defined in section 109.04 of the standard specifications. Next we have GCT 2500. This is on the Gilcrease Expressway. Contractor is Gilcrease Developers. This is for supplemental agreement number 28 for the agreed amount of $147,193.39. This supplemental agreement adds eight new items to the contract to compensate the contractor for additional work. An item for dr driveway alterations is needed to match a new driveway at 41st Street with, with existing field conditions. 
curb is being added to, constru to construct a curb return at 53rd Street, which was unaccounted for in the original plans and is needed to direct stormwater to the gutter. Riprap is being added for use at structures 332, 334, 307A, 307B, and 308 to dissipate the flow of water and control surface erosion. Grading is being added to account for the change to a planned grading adjacent to the pedestrian trail north of 40, 41st Street in order to achieve adequate surface draining. Handrail is being added at the end section of bridge box X to increase tra safety adjacent to the sidewalk, which parallels 41st Street. In addition, an item for the addition of regulatory signs at 51st Street and pavement markings at 41st Street is being added to for improved intersection safety. An item for electrical service rewiring is being added for repair work at toll plazas one, two, and three, which is required due to the change of the originally planned wiring diagram to, to better protect the tolling equipment within the cabinet. Lastly, a drainage ditch is being added at 57th Street to direct the flow of stormwater from an existing culvert end to an adjacent ditch, otherwise accounted for in the original plans. These items contain all material, labor, and equipment necessary to perform this work. Next, we have INMC 62E. This is the cable barrier project between milepost 0 to 16 near Antlers. Contractor is built right construction. This is for change order number four for the agreed amount of negative $160,407.69. This change order establishes a final quantity for items on the original contract and those items added by supplemental agreement that deviated from the original quantity. Deductions and other adjustments associated with this contract will be identified on the final estimate. <coughs> INMC 70B, this is the asphalt pavement rehabilitation between milepost 20 to 30 on the Indian Nation Turnpike. The contractor is APAC Central. This is for change order number one for the agreed <coughs> amount of $162,763.17. This change order provides additional funding for pavement smoothness incentive. In accordance with special provision 430-2QA, parenthesis A-J19 of the construction contract, the contractor earned a pavement smoothness incentive of $162,763.17. Yes, sir, we incentivize it so we can get a smoother road for the traveling public. Okay. It just takes a little extra work to get it smoother. That is correct, okay. yes. Next, we have TER037. This is for the emergency repair at Bridge 31.3 in Lincoln County. Contractor is built right construction. This is for change order number two for the agreed amount of negative $31,047.32. This change order establishes a final quantity for items on the original co contract and those items added by supplemental agreement that deviated from the original quantity. Deductions or other adjustments associated with, with this contract will be identified on the final estimate. TMC 107-TR1, this is the work zone traffic control and service vehicle between milepost 215 to 222 in Tulsa and Creek counties. The contractor's advanced work zone services. This is for change order number two for the agreed amount of negative $13,098.28. This change order establishes the final quantity for items on the original contract and those items added by supplemental agreement that deviated from the original quantity. Deductions or other adjustments associated with this contract will be identified on the final estimate. And the last item we have is for WRMC 138. This is the asphalt pavement rehabilitation between milepost 265 to 270 on the Will Rogers Turnpike. The contractor is Robinson Construction. This is for change order number one and for supplemental agreement number one. This is for the agreed amount of $138,852.47. This also has a time extension of 13 days. This change order adds one new item and provides additional funding for pavement smoothness incentive. 
in accordance for special provision 430-AQA at parenthesis A-J19 of the construction contract, the contractor earned a pavement smoothness incentive of $40,916.47. A new item for SuperPave S4 PG7628 is added to the contract at a negotiated reduced price. This item is utilized for pavement repairs on westbound Will Rogers between mile markers 265 and 266. Additionally, this change order adds 13 days to the contract to allow for these necessary surface repairs. I will be happy to answer any questions. Are there any other questions for Mrs. Nelson? If not, I move that we approve this item as presented. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Berry. We have a motion for approval of item 1124. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Love. Please vote at the appropriate time. Um, item 1124 has been approved. Uh, Mrs. Nelson, you got item 1125. The next item is 112 half submitted for the authority's consideration is the request for the following items to be approved. This is for CMC 30. This is for the construction management services for bridge number 22.5, which is a bridge rehabilitation and cable barrier installation near Morrison in Noble County. This is on the Cimarron Turnpike. The consultant is SRB with a not to exceed amount of $410,993, excuse me, $410,993, and 23, 25 cents, excuse me. Uh, this is 4% of the construction cost, and we have reviewed, staff has reviewed the above items, and we recommend approval. Any further questions? If not, I move that we approve this item as presented. Thank you, Mr. Berry. We have a motion for approval of item 1125. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Please vote at the appropriate time. Item 1125 has been approved. Uh, Ms. Nelson, item 1126. The last item on behalf of Construction Division is item 1126. This is for the construction management contract inspection and testing on the Indian Nation Turnpike. This is for project INMC62G. This is the construction management services for the cable barrier installation between mile post 17 uh, 34 near Antlers in Pishmataha County. The consultant is Olson with a not to exceed amount of $599,220.30. This, uh, this amount is about 5.8% of the construction cost. And this amount is a lot lower than we normally see because we have two key staff personnel that live within this proximity, which reduces the cost of that. And staff has reviewed the above items and we recommend approval. I have a quick question. Yes, sir. Um, with the addition of these 17 miles, how much of the Indian Nation left do we have for cable barrier? I cannot fully um, answer that question, but I will allow Darren Butler with engineering to answer that for you, sir. Okay. Yeah. We have one project left. It's about 18 miles. That'll be left next year. Very good. Look forward to all that being cable barriered. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I move that we approve this item as presented. Thank you, Mr. Berry. We have a motion for approval of item 1126. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Love. <clears throat> Please vote electronically at the appropriate time. The uh, votes have been tallied and item 1126 has been approved. Thanks, Ms. Nelson. Uh, Mr. Butler, you got the next three items. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Good to see everybody this morning. <clears throat> You'll have to excuse me. My, my voice is a little bit raspy this morning. I've been feeling a little bit under the weather since that Bedlam game <laughs> on uh, Saturday. So if, uh, if you'll bear with me, we'll, we'll get through this. Uh, <clears throat> Engineering Division has three items we'd like to present this morning uh, for consideration. That's items 11, 27, uh, 28, and 29. Item 1127, this is a construction contract award for Project CMC 35. Uh, this is bridge rehabilitation of bridge 25.74 at milepost 
25.74 in Noble County project includes replacement of deck beams, parapet, approach slabs, bearings, shoulders, and guardrail. You can see there we had four pretty good bids. Low bidders, Manhattan Road and Bridge in the amount of $3,318,472.35. This is about 3.7% uh, over the engineer's estimate. And I think we can live with that. That's great. Do we have any questions on item 1127? If not, I move that we approve this item as presented. Thank you, Mr. Berry. We have a motion for approval of item 1127. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Please vote at the appropriate time. Item 1128, Mr. Butler. <laughs> Yeah, item 1128, uh, this is submitted for the consideration of the authorities request to authorize the director to execute three separate agreements with various environmental mitigation management companies for the purchase of compensatory mitigation credits related to Turner Turnpike Access Program Projects TMC 107A1 and TMC 107A2. These agreements between the parties will provide OTA with sufficient stream and wetland compensatory mitigation credits to satisfy Section 404 of the United States Environmental Protection Agency Clean Water Act, which is regulated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. These compensatory mitigation requirements are in association with Permit SWT-2016-00605 and will be fulfilled to adequately mitigate areas adversely impacted by the reference projects where protected aquatic resources cannot be avoided. The total cost of the three agreements is $805,619. <clears throat> First agreement there is with, uh, between OTA and Deep Fork Mitigation uh, Bank uh, for the credit purchase agreement for the purchase of 0 0.2 forested wetland credits at a unit cost of $16,000 per credit and 1,293.6 Oklahoma Stream Mitigation Method ephemeral stream credits at a unit cost of $115. Uh, per credit for a total price of $151,964. Second agreement is between OTA and the Terra Foundation Incorporated Purchase Agreement for the purchase of 3,260 Oklahoma Stream Mitigation uh, Method Intermittent Stream Credits at a unit cost of $65 per credit uh, and 0 0.2 Emergent Wetland Credits in Beaver slash North Canadian East service area of the NLU fee program at a unit cost of $65,000 per acre for a total price of $224,900. The third agreement is between OTA and Honey Springs Mitigation Bank. Uh, this agreement is for the purchase of 885 Oklahoma Stream Mitigation Method uh, intermittent stream credits at a unit cost of $160 per credit and 2,497 ephemeral stream credits at a unit cost $115 per credit for a total price of $428,755. And if I, if I may uh, just elaborate on this a little bit further, um, I've sent each of uh, the board members some backup information uh, on this at the end of last week and just wanted to talk uh, just quickly about the project itself which is the TMC, uh, TMC 107A1, A2 um, part of this project. There's also a third part, which is TMC 107B3, uh, which is uh, on and off ramp construction uh, there between Kellyville and Bristow, uh, which will connect State Highway 66, which runs over the Turner Turnpike. So that project is in conjunction with these two projects, A1 and A2. We just didn't have any mitigation requirements for the core uh, in that B3 project, so it's not showing up in this agenda item. Um, but our plan for this project, again, this will be our first uh, access program project, uh, is to open bids on this project on uh, Thursday, day after tomorrow. So we're going to be bringing this uh, back to the board, this construction project for a construction contract award. That project currently has an estimate of around $110 million. And again, it extends um, immediately east of Bristow Interchange, and it will extend uh, north and east until it picks back up with where we've already widened. So 
uh, certainly looking forward to uh, getting this project underway. Uh, but as this project was designed uh, under the Driving Forward program, uh, part of that process, anytime we get start getting outside of our footprint, we have to do those environmental studies. And from those environmental studies, we have to take that information, submit it to the Corps of Engineers for a reference 404 permit, and that's when the, uh, the Army Corps comes back and says, I think we damaged f uh, over 5,000, uh, or impacted over 5,000 linear feet of, of stream on this project and uh, 26 hundredths of an, of an acre. So they come back, they uh, um, ask us to adhere to certain requirements, and then that's, that's where we get this agenda item here today is um, kind of making right the waters, the protected of our sense of waters that we've impacted for uh, these projects is the reason for this here today. That was a lot. I'll be happy to answer any questions on that. <laughs> Anybody have any further questions? If not, I move that we approve item 1128 as presented. Thank you, Mr. Berry. <clears throat> we have a motion for approval of item 1128. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Love. Please vote electronically at the appropriate time. Uh, item 1129, Mr. Butler. Yes, item 1129, submitted for consideration approval of the authority's request to ratify the executive director's October 16, 2023, declaration of an emergency and award of a contract to Built Right Construction LLC, the amount of $85,343.77 to repair TPU Bridge 31.3 on the Turner Turnpike. Uh, we've got the uh, memorandum from October 16th um, on the following uh, page there. On October 13th of 2023, TPU Bridge 31.3 over the Turner Turnpike was struck by an overheight uh, vehicle in the westbound direction. This bridge carries traffic over the Turner Turnpike to and from the city of Chandler, State, State Highway 18. The work will consist of heat straightening, removing and replacing a portion of the east exterior girder over the westbound lanes. Immediate repairs are necessary to restore the structural integrity of the bridge and to make it safe for the public traveling on and below uh, the bridge. And again, you can see uh, Bill Wright's uh, bid there in the amount of $85,343.77. And I believe these repairs are scheduled to take place, um, I believe, the Monday after Veterans Day. So just to elaborate on this one just real quick, just a little bit further, uh, obviously this is our, our problem bridge on the Turner Turnpike, again, primarily because of its age. It has a, a really low vertical clearance. So uh, this is a, a project in our access uh, program. Uh, this segment is in our access program. So we've decided, I think, to accelerate that portion of that access program project. Uh, to remove this bridge from our from our system, so uh, we're going to keep our fingers crossed up till that point. But we're going to bring this this access program project to the front of the line uh, for the purpose of re this will remove this bridge from our system and remove some more of these orders. That's right. That's right. <laughs> What's yes. the uh, height of this bridge? This bridge, I believe, is uh, fourteen uh, three. Posted at 14.1, Jimmy, is that 14.4? Yeah. Any more questions on item 1129? If not, I move that we approve this item as presented. We have a uh, motion for approval of item 1129. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, please vote at the appropriate time. This item's been approved. Mr. Butler, too, I do want to uh, confirm with you that there are several others of us that are feeling your pain from Saturday. Okay. You're not alone. <laughs> when I look around this room, I wonder about that something. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Butler. Uh, the next item is item 1130, which will be presented by Mrs. Rhonda Powell. Good morning, Chairman Jones, members of the authority, Secretary Gatz, Deputy Director E. Kelly. Uh, the Right-of-Way Utilities and Facilities Division would like to present item number 1130 for consideration. 
In 2003, parcel CR344 containing 18.79 acres with access rights to South Aspen Avenue was required by the authority as part of the partial acquisition for the construction of the Creek Turnpike. Now, the current owner of the remaining property has requested that the authority restore a portion of the access rights to accommodate a 40-foot right-in, right-out driveway in the vicinity of the intersection of West Norfolk Drive and South Aspen Avenue in Broken Air, Oklahoma. A staff review of the traffic analysis in the property was conducted and it has been determined that the requested restoration of access right will not adversely impact the maintenance or operation of the Creek Turnpike or the safety of the traveling public on East Aspen Avenue. Based on that determination and the staff's recommendation, the following is submitted for the authority's consideration and vote to approve. Declare as surplus, surplus approximately 40 feet of access rights for South Aspen Avenue, part of Section 34, Township 18 North and uh, Range 14 East in Tulsa County, owned by the authority on the Creek Turnpike, authorizes the director to obtain a survey, appraisal, and sell, lease, or otherwise dispose of the property, <clears throat> including use in a land swap to acquire other property needed for the Turnpike system. <clears throat> I'd be happy to answer any questions. How do we enforce right in, right out? I mean, is there gonna be a signage that says right turn only? Yes. And our highway patrol are going to sit there and monitor that? I'm sorry, could you repeat <laughs> that? And our highway patrol are going to sit and monitor that? Um, no, I think it'll be, go ahead. So the, the answer to that question, it'll be designed in such a way that you can't pull in or out, okay. turning to the left. Um, obviously, you know, somebody can do that in error, but that, that design uh, will work with the, <laughs> the property owner there to ensure that it's safe to be built like that. And you'll see these in developed areas and, and in this location I think they're wanting to put a business in here yes. and they wanted to have access from the south that didn't didn't require it to go all the way around it was a condition of the developer in that location yeah and and the secretary's reminding me to, to add a little bit more to that the there's usually a barrier in the middle like a, a raised curb that de okay. deters people from making a left-hand turn uh, and basically it tapers out into the traveled lanes because without a turn lane it just looks like an accident waiting to happen yeah the, you'll <laughs> this this location looks a little bit different than this already there's already some development going on but it'll be right in right out and then if you want to make a left-hand turn that uh, entrance that's a little bit further north of there is where that uh, access would be the main thing is is because it's free flow coming off of the ramp you know the, the part that we the turnpike really cares about is traffic getting off the turnpike, that, it, that this doesn't cause some kind of backup, but allowing a right-hand, free flow right-hand turn into the new developer's parking lot uh, eliminates that. So it's, it's, really, it's really a good design in this location. The reason we purchased access rights was to prevent that, right. uh, allowing though in this case a right-in, right-out kind of uh, mitigates that issue. Okay, thank you. I think there's a typo you either have range 14 east or range 13 east just for clarification oh okay thank you are there any other questions on item 1130 if not i move that we approve this item as presented thank you mr berry we have a motion for approval of item 1130 do we have a second second motion thank you mr love please <coughs> vote to appropriate time electronically <coughs> Item 1130 has been approved. My last item is item 1131, which will be presented by Mrs. Rhonda Powell. Thank you. Um, agenda item 1131, uh, the following parcels consisting of the approximate acres and the locations identified below were previously acquired by the authority. Part of parcels Turner 54 and 55, section 24, Township 18 North, range 11 East, approximately 2.24 acres on the Turner Turnpike in Creek County. A staff review of the property was conducted and has been determined that a portion of the described parcel in the approximate acreage identified was acquired as uneconomic remnants and is not needed for any construction or maintenance needs of the Turnpike system. Based on that determination, staff recommends that the authority consider and vote to declare the above described parcels 
surplus and authorize the director to obtain a survey, appraisal, and sell, lease, or otherwise dispose of the property, including use in a land swap to acquire other property needed by the turnpike system. Staff has reviewed this item and recommends approval. Are there any questions? I have a, a question from looking at the map. You have a red outline and a yellow half of that inside there. Yes, what sir. is the red outline indicating? That's a great question. The red outline was the original amount of um, surplus. When we came to the board several years ago, I think it was 2007, um, we only requested that top part, and now we're coming back to ask for the, uh, the 2.74 acres that's outlined in the yellow box. So the, the, the portion that's not within the yellow has already been? Yes, sir. Sold? 2000 transacted? Seven. Okay. 2007. That's a good answer. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? If not, I move that we approve line item 1131 as presented. Thank you, Mr. Berry. We have a motion for approval of item 1131. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Please vote electronically at the appropriate time. Item 1131 has passed. <clears throat> that concludes our budget and construction items. Now on to the report portion. Our first report is Major Canada with the Highway Patrol Report. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Chairman, members of the authority, Secretary Gatz, Director e. Kelly. For the month of September, Turnpike Troopers made 3,770 violator contacts and we assisted 595 motorists. We investigated 108 motor vehicle collisions and worked 880 shifts. Uh, we averaged 190 miles per shift for just over 167,000 miles driven. Uh, we did have three fatalities on the turnpike system, two on the Bailey and one on the, uh, one on the Turner. Uh, we did have nine criminal interdictions. Um, I've included specific information about uh, commercial motor vehicle, um, aircraft traffic, uh, toll and motorcycle enforcement in your, um, in your report, as well as uh, collision reduction efforts. Uh, before I open for any questions, I'd like to just thank, uh, thank the authority for their continued support of our partnership and uh, appreciate all you do. So thank you. And I'll take any questions. You know, it's been a great partnership and, and I was just talking to Major Kennedy before our board meeting and uh, I think, uh, Joe, we were down to what, about 89 at one time on the, on the, as far as our troopers and we're authorized about 130, and we're now up to 113, I think. Or I told you 113. Is, that was the, the vehicle count. We're 111. We're um, 111. So, so I mean, we've made down. some progress there. Yes, so have. I think that's all. I think that's all good. I hope to make some more in the in the upcoming yeah. year. So, thank you. I had a couple questions on the fatalities on the on the two referenced on the Bailey. Were they had they come to a stop in the roadway, or how did both of them get hit in the rear? So. One of them, I, th I think the first one that you're referencing, I think traffic had slowed and had another driver not paying attention. Um, I don't remember that specifically, but I, I saw an email when that one came out. Um, the other one, yes, he stopped in the roadway. Um, oh. Again, you always see that on the Turner a lot. Uh, it's, it's not unheard of on the Bailey, but you know, it's, it's just not a good, not good to stop in any roadway, but with that volume of traffic, you're, you're opening yourself up to peril were they wearing seat belts? Do we know that? Were on the on the one that um, actually on either one, I don't I don't know the answer to that. Okay, I know Secretary Gatz is always uh, commenting about the uh, continued use and uh, need for the reminder that we wear seat belts, and uh, certainly this is a good reminder. Absolutely, it's a sad one, but it's a. It's a good reminder that we certainly need to keep doing that. I, on the Bailey, we've got quite a bit of construction going on with the Dalbar retrofit and diamond grinding, so that's probably part of the reason for that. After doing some research, it, it usually holds that about 40% of our fatalities involve an unrestrained occupant yeah. or driver. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. uh, it's the one thing a, a person can do once they get in a vehicle that will ensure their, their safety and reduce injuries. So. Well, we appreciate everything you do, um, and we're glad to continue to support thank you thank you 
Next report is Consulting Engineers Report, uh, Mr. Sparks. Wearing that Oklahoma State tie. <laughs> yeah, yes. As a uh, reminder. Unlike Darren, there's a few of us that are feeling no pain today, so uh, it couldn't be better. The, 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 the sun is brighter and all that now. <laughs> it's not a feeling we get all that often, so let us have our moment, please. So, um, <laughs> uh, good morning, Chairman Jones, members of the authority, Secretary Gatz. Uh, with the approval of pre preliminary budget for 2024 today, uh, course always talk about reinvestment and all that and, and certainly some of the major asset preservation that is part of the uh, uh, plan five-year uh, um, the uh, the proposed five-year capital plan improvements they include more than 173 million in pavement rehab 82 million for bridges uh, 55 million for Dalbar retrofits and diamond grinding which takes our older concrete pavements and, and uh, uh, puts the load transfer devices in there, then grind, grind smooth so we don't have the impact loading and, and really extends the life of our concrete pavements. Uh, 19 million interchanges and then 113 million for other safety surface treatment striping and guardrail improvements. So so a very, uh, a very good reinvestment. And, and along those lines, we kind of had that on display last week with a uh, bridge on HE Bailey where there was a, uh, a crack noticed in the pier cap. Uh, required further investigation, and, and uh, you know, and Secretary Gatz often talks about those bridges that may have a five, which uh, puts them in a fair condition. You know, they're teetering maybe sometimes, and with certain elements going to a four. So uh, that one does not constitute an emergency, but does need to be corrected to uh, uh, um, to address to address those issues. So again, that all just to point out that uh, while we have a great amount of reinvestment. You know the the job that maintenance does to to keep up with those things and and all those all have to come together to keep our system operating at very high levels um, in august our engineers checked uh, 17 overload trucks for travel in the system so we have seen that increase over the last few months um, we did have two special impact uh, reports in our monthly in, a, in our monthly report uh, one was the turner turnpike bridge 31.3 that will be repaired under contract teo 39 that darren talked about earlier and the other was an overhead sign structure at the Riverside uh, interchange on the Creek Turnpike. Uh, the structure has been taken down and is uh, while it's uh, to be repaired. Uh, in both cases, the, uh, the, the person impacting was, was identified. As always, our capital plan project summary is in our monthly report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. <coughs> any, any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. I had to refrain from asking you a comment about the football game. <clears throat> the next uh, item is trustee report, Rachel Singleton. Good morning, Chair, Chairman and Board Members. As bond trustee to the authority, all monthly debt service transfers were made for the semi-annual payments due to the bondholders as required by the trust agreement. The preliminary annual budgets approved earlier are requirements of the trust agreement and both received. The semi-annual debt service reserve fund valuation have been completed and provided to the authority and also required a requirement of the trust agreement. Questions of my report? Any questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next report is Wendy Smith, operating results and financial condition. Good morning. Good morning, again. <laughs> you have all received your operations report for September prepared by the Comptroller Division and as reported, net toll revenues uh, for September of 2023 on the system reported at $32 million, an increase of 7.4% as compared to September 2022. Total transactions were relatively flat in comparison to last year with heavy truck traffic continuing to remain strong over that same time period. Additionally, year-to-date toll revenues continue to outpace budgeted projections by 3.9%. Also, uh, year-to-date expenses are uh, about 16.6% .6 below uh, annualized our annualized budget so far this year. So I wanted to give a quick overview of the first financing for the access program. We were very proud to be ready uh, to uh, enter the market as soon as we could. Uh, that takes a lot of preparation. Uh, all we had to do was update, um, but we're very proud of that. And a lot of that goes to uh, Jordan Perdue, who, who is, is a very prime member of that team. He keeps us going as far as those bond um, things go. And so I'm really proud of that, that we were ready. Um, 
The authority posted its preliminary official statement two weeks prior to the date of pricing with an online investor presentation following shortly thereafter, giving investors adequate time to review the access program, the plan of finance, and other key updates of the authority. One-on-one -on -one meetings were held with investors video via conference, uh, video conference, although we only held two because most of the investors are just, uh, they're very familiar with us. They don't pay any attention to the noise that's out there. They understand that we're in really good financial shape and they're really willing and wanting to buy those bonds. Um, the feedback was positive. No investors expressed any concerns regarding litigation, the potential investigative audit, or any other matters to the authority, the underwriting syndicate, or to the sales force. We ended up leading the market that day, and ultimately the strength of the credit and management team, as well as the syndicate's pre-marketing initiatives, resulted in a very successful pricing. The transaction garnered uh, orders from 50 unique institutional investors, as well as individual retail participation, which is always given priority, Oklahoma retail in particular, and it resulted in three times the an oversubscription of what we had to offer. So on October 26, 2023, the authority closed on the delivery of the $500 million in Series 2023 second senior revenue bonds, its first bond issue of the program, and we received our construction proceeds and is ready to get to work. And we are really excited that we were able to do that. So. Now the engineers can get to work on this program. And with your permission, I would like to call Mike Newman, the authority's financial advisor, to the podium to make some additional remarks. <clears throat> Staying with the theme of the day. <laughs> <laughs> to take you back in time, as Wendy mentioned, on October 2nd, the preliminary official statement was issued by the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority. That's required by law to be true and correct and not omit something to make it materially misleading or a fact material misleading. Investors rely on that to do their analysis and make an informed investment decision. As Wendy mentioned, no investor expressed any concern regarding litigation, the attorney general investigation, or a letter from a bondholder that made certain allegations, which was all fully disclosed as appropriate and required, but led by general counsel to the authority, Eric Lair, disclosure counsel. It was well written, informative, and generated no questions. I would also highlight in the preliminary official statement, it included the ratings from three rating agencies. They were AA minus, AA minus, AA three which were the same ratings before this program was announced, before access. In meeting with the rating agencies, which was done more than 10 times, I think we were around 14 over the past year to update them and disclose all that was happening as access was being considered. What was disclosed to them was projections, including the proposed debt to be issued for the next 10 years by the authority to, comp to work on access. So that's all been fully disclosed to the rating agencies. We were joined in New York by Chairman Jones, uh, Deputy Director Joey Kelly, Julie Porter, Wendy Smith, Jordan Perdue. And it was important, it was a volatile market. Things were moving around. The underwriters were led by RBC. And in a volatile market, you want to be flexible to adjust to the changing times, and it was very helpful to have everyone there so that as we received feedback on market conditions, we could discuss adjustments to the bond structure, whether it was moving the proposed interest rate by three basis points or moving principal from one maturity to another to ensure no unsold balances. It afforded the authority the opportunity to look the senior underwriter from RBC in the eye and judge for themselves, did they believe what they were hearing? We as financial advisor to the authority had our own underwriting desk involved, advising the authority on the appropriateness of the pricing. When the pricing started, about eight o'clock that morning, interest rates started to rise because retail sales came in higher than expected. So based on a recommendation from RBC, interest rates were increased by three basis points and three basis points alone. That turned out to be very appropriate and 
led to a very successful marketing. That approach was mirrored later in the day by North Texas Tollway Authority based on the success of the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority. As Wendy mentioned, $1.47 billion of orders were received for $500 million worth of bonds. 50 individual investors, and as Wendy said, all retail investors and all retail investors in Oklahoma were first priority and their orders were filled. Investors do not rely solely on rating agencies. They do not commit their money based on someone else's analysis. They do their own. Susquehanna Investments placed an order for $415 million of the authority's bonds by themselves. They do not rely on rating agencies. They do their own analysis. Another investor ordered $120 million. A third investor, $100 million. These folks do their individual analysis and rely on their internal credit. The credit rating agencies are only one thing that they look at. So when we talk about the acceptance of the authority's bonds, it's not just the rating agencies. It is investors doing their own work, their own analysis. Interest rates were rising during that day. While well, interest rates rose as measured by the index against which the authority's bonds are priced, rose 10 basis points, the yields on the authority's bonds based on that strong order book were reduced one to two basis points. At the end of the day, the spread of the authority's bond to the index in a rising rate environment declined by 10 basis points. That's an indication of acceptance. Those orders are an indication of acceptance, trust, and confidence in the authority. The cost of capital realized by the authority was approximately 5.17%. But to put that in context, the authority borrowed money for slightly over 27 years. As the chairman commented in New York at the time, home mortgages were 7 and 8% secured by a home. This debt is not secured by the turnpikes, it is secured by the revenues of the authority. Nothing more. But I'd ask just to think about that, 5.17% and a home mortgage 7 and 8%. Kind of sums it up pretty well. The authority was welcomed in the market. The sale couldn't have gone better. The underwriting syndicate led by RBC did a very good job in very challenging market environment not because of the authority, but because of the volatility generally in the fixed income markets. And Wendy has heard me say many times, you cannot control, you cannot time the market. What you, you trust in the process, do the right things for the right reasons, and you get the best results the day of pricing that the market can give you. And that's what was done. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mike. I wanted to share <clears throat> with uh, fellow board members and, and everyone here, especially the OTA team, about my observations from um, attending the, the bond sale. Um, as has this been previously stated, you know, OTA at $500 million bond sale was oversubscribed by three times. We had national and state buyers. In 75 minutes, which is approximately 5% of time in a day, we were oversold. Some of our country's smartest financial people, representing national and local firms, vetted OTA, did their thorough due diligence, and were more than satisfied that we are a very good investment. Smart, savvy investors like our credit rating, they like our business model, they like our management, and they like our vision. Simply, we perform, and they recognize that. That's why 50 different investment firms bought our bonds. They diligently looked at the facts, not fiction, and liked what they saw. The market on this day was looking for safe harbors, and the bond market was very popular. On a competitive day, when it took five to 10 additional basis points to get other deals done, we were able to get ours done in the two to four basis point range, which Mike went into more detail about. That in itself speaks to the quality investment of OTA bonds. 
OTA in its entirety should be proud of this achievement and recognition. I know that I speak for the entire board in saying that we are proud of you and proud to be your board. This sale validated everything we do and stands for and should be recognized as such. And that will continue as we build out the access program. Job well done. Job well done. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Any other comments about the bond sale money or board members? What's that, Mr. Chairman? I would just, I would just say uh, I'm a little jealous you got to be there. And the <laughs> second thing is that, uh, yeah, I think John said it very well. We are really proud of you. And, and it's obviously the team that went there, um, and, and, but also the work that everybody does every day that puts us in this position because we all know that you don't get in this position through the actions of one day. You get in this position through the acts of every day, day in and day out, for weeks, months, and years. So thank you. Thanks, Dan. You know, one more comment, too. You know, we talk about this very frequently at our monthly meetings, but, uh, you know, the finance team does such an incredible job. When Wendy gives her report, she talks about revenues up and expenses down. I mean, that's just awfully, awfully good, and we appreciate that very much. Thank you, Jane. Uh, our next report is the director's report, Secretary Gatz. Mr. Chairman, board members, uh, I've been having a little bit of trouble with my voice too <laughs> since about <laughs> since about 5:30 Saturday. Uh, <laughs> Not because I'm under the weather, though. So, um, about a year ago, I sat in a cabinet meeting with uh, lots of cabinet members and listened to a discussion about fentanyl and the effect that fentanyl is having on our society today. And I walked out of that cabinet meeting more than concerned with some of the numbers that I heard. And to put it in perspective, uh, and, and certainly we're gonna have some folks here that'll visit with us that know infinitely more about this than I do. Uh, but the number that concerned me is, was a six figure number in excess of 100,000 deaths related to opioid overdose, uh, specific fentanyl. And to put that in perspective, we lose far too many individuals in traffic fatalities on our highway system, in turnpike system, with millions and millions of miles traveled across this country every day to the tune of about 47,000 fatalities in the United States. So we're losing far more folks to this problem. So needless to say, I walked out of that room concerned and I challenged Joe because of that concern and because of the nature of this substance to the potential impact that it could have on our employees and beyond that to the potential impact that we could encounter in our interactions with the traveling public. Uh, so again, what I, I had a simple request of Joe please make sure that we have Narcan in every first aid kit that we have in a vehicle. Simple ask. Please go work with, uh, with mental health and substance abuse and see if we can get that done. Well, as Joe often does in his interactions, he took it to the next level, thankfully. And uh, I wanna, if, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to welcome to the podium uh, Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services Commissioner Carrie Slatton Hodges, and she's going to give us a little bit of an update about a little bit more about this problem that we've got and a lot more about where we're at with it and how we've partnered together uh, to potentially save some lives uh, in something that's a little bit non traditional in the Turnpike Authority's work, but no less important than preventing a traffic fatality. So, Mr. Chairman, if I might. Commissioner. Thank you so much. 
So thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. I have some slides I'm going to share with you when we get them pulled up. All right. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about this problem um, that is a nationwide problem. And I want to tell you a little bit about it in Oklahoma as well. Um, accidental overdose by an opiate is actually the leading cause of death for people under 50 in the United States today. It's just unbelievable when you think of all the other things going on. Now, I will tell you in Oklahoma, many years ago, we had difficulties with prescription opiates, which really started leading a lot of people down the path of addiction. But as a state, everybody pulled together and made some amazing changes that really plummeted the rate of prescribing of opiates in Oklahoma, thus causing less people to become addicted and to die from overdoses from that. So we had a couple of years where we were doing well in the nation and in Oklahoma. And then we had this huge sweep now of the introduction of fentanyl, which is a synthetic opiate. And um, in doing so, um, it, and when we talk about those overdose deaths in our nation today, 70% are from the synthetic opiate fentanyl. It has just taken over our nation. It is so deadly. Um, a speck of fentanyl will kill a person. So one of the things that's so important that we really want to talk to you about today is those boxes that you have in front of you, which is a substance called naloxone. And naloxone reverses an overdose. It is a nasal spray that can be administered by anybody. It's very easy to do. And the importance of having naloxone out in society to prevent overdose deaths cannot be understated. Um, in Oklahoma, we use Narcan, and that's what you have in front of you. There's two in each box, because we will be encouraging you to uh, carry those with you in the future. We also distribute what are called fentanyl test strips. So if there is a person that's going to take a pill or is going to use a substance, what we know is today it is likely to be laced with fentanyl. They don't think they're taking fentanyl, but almost everything is laced with fentanyl today. There are pills that are pressed um, and made and distributed that look just like Oxycontin, that look just like Xanax, and they're laced with fentanyl. So people are dying from one pill who never knew they were ingesting fentanyl. What fentanyl test strips do is it allows a person to test any substance that they may ingest to determine whether fentanyl is in it. Now, I asked um, some folks that do street outreach for us to folks that are very addicted. Um, you mean when someone's actually purchased an item that they might test it, see it has fentanyl, and then not take it? And what they told me is, what they will do is make sure they have someone with them, and they'll make sure that naloxone is present. So in case they have an overdose, it will save their life. So the objective is to really increase awareness around uh, accidental overdose and that this is happening every day all across our state, and then also increasing access to naloxone so that if someone does encounter someone, that could possibly be having an overdose, they could save that person's life. We do um, access in a couple of ways. We have a website that anybody can go to, enter their information, and we mail out free naloxone to them. But we also wanted to get further out to the public and make this as accessible as possible, and so we started down this path of looking at using vending machines to put naloxone and fentanyl test strips in those and put them out around the country, or around the state. We place them in areas where we think there would be um, a high need and high traffic. And uh, when Joe and Secretary Gatz, when we all discussed this, we thought what a perfect partnership it would be if we could utilize our transportation authority stops to place naloxone and fentanyl strip vending machines. So that's what we've done. So there is no standard profile for somebody that uses substances. It could be anybody around you you may not know. And so it's really important that we get these into the hands of as many people as possible. 
We also know that 80% of overdose deaths happen at home, and the majority of the time there is someone present. But the death happens when naloxone is not present as well. So this is what one of our vending machines look like. And we have 40 that we're distributing statewide. I think today 20 of those are out. And it's the largest program in the nation to get naloxone um, out to our citizens. Um, again, uh, this is what the naloxone looks like, and that's what fentanyl test strips look like. And you may have seen this pink and black advertising because we have a large marketing campaign going on. You may see it at bus stops, on social media, a number of different things to spread the word about the importance of having naloxone present to reverse an overdose. Um, each of the machine holds 100 naloxone kits um, with two doses in each kit and 54 tents. Uh, fentanyl test strips. Um, this is the size and shape of those. And all a customer has to do is to enter their zip code and it will be distributed. And that helps us collect data um, to know about where people are using, where most likely hot spots are. And then the department monitors these and restocks these vending machines. Um, they're Wi-Fi enabled, cellular connectivity, um, refrigeration is not necessarily necessary unless it's installed outdoors. Um, when they're installed indoors, um, uh, there's not a need for refrigeration on these machines. So the first 20 machines have been placed across the state in service plazas, casinos, casinos, libraries, and more. But what in our partnership with the Turnpike Authority, you can see on this map, we have the OTA Will Rogers archway entrance. We have, um, um, I'm having trouble seeing, uh, uh, is that Chim Chimmy? Chandler. Chandler. Lone Chimney. Oh, Lone Chimney, yes. Um, so you can see as you, as you traverse turnpikes, you can see where we've placed these at Turnpike Authority locations. And what I want you to know is that this is making a huge difference. In fact, it has blown everything else out of the water in terms of getting naloxone out to citizens. Um, and now on a month-to-month -month basis, over 50% of the distribution is coming through these vending machines at the Turnpike locations. So this is making a world of difference for our citizens. And I can't just stress enough how important this partnership has been um, and that I don't know that you would ever have thought this. Of course, with roads and bridges, bridges you save lives every day, but through this, y'all are saving lives every day as well. So um, you can just kind of see where um, some of the hot spots here um, of uh, of how the distribution is going for naloxone and fentanyl test strips. You can see the blue lines there at the Turnpike Authority locations, um, how much is being distributed out of there, and it's really phenomenal. Um, again, this is uh, average daily use by, uh, by location on both of these, and again, you can see where those Turnpike locations are just rising above um, virtually everything else except our Embark location uh, here in the hub of Oklahoma City. And that's what I wanted to share with you today, is that this is making a huge difference. Our partnership is making a huge difference in being able to get these into the hands of citizens um, and therefore saving lives every day. So thank you all for what you do. Thank you, Secretary, and thank you to Joe, who um, started these dialogues with us so that we could um, save Oklahoma lives. I'm happy to answer any questions, if any of you have any. Any questions? You know, the police department in, in Lawton recently uh, took 3,500 pills from one individual. And you know, I think they indicated that, that just that amount from one individual could have killed a couple of hundred thousand people. That's absolutely It's true. crazy. It, it is. It's so, unbelievable. Yeah. Especially in a day and age where one pill will yeah. kill you. Yes. Thanks for allowing OTA to partner. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, we have these vending machines now at uh, Benita, Muskogee, Chickasha, Chandler, Lone Chimney, and Walters. 
and are working right now to uh, have a vending machine installed at McAllister. Uh, so again, it's been a great partnership for us. Uh, and again, you're beginning to hear more discussion around this problem, uh, but this, you know, when you get into the world of fentanyl, it, you know, we always are fairly familiar with methamphetamine and the problem that it's caused for Oklahoma. Uh, this stuff makes meth look like chocolate milk. So we have to continue to talk about it. We have to continue to engage at every opportunity. And uh, again, I'm, I'm extremely proud. Again, my initial concern was for our employees and the traveling public. Uh, I want to thank Joe for, again, engaging the way he did and embracing this, you know, and, and really helping to, to make that materialize out in the travel plazas because it's been an obvious success. So uh, again, it's, a, it's just another example of the Turnpike Authority looking for ways to help the citizens of the state of Oklahoma. So. Talked about our, our uh, bond sale, and uh, like I said, I, I don't know that I've got much to add to what's been said here today other than uh, just really thanking the team for all the work that they've done. Um, remind everybody that, you know, we stopped work in April, and it's going to take some time for us to, to re-engage and get things going again. Uh, we're going to take a hard look at reprioritizing and uh, understanding where we're at with those projects. Um, the Turner Turnpike and the work that needs to be done there is going to be our focus in 2024, uh, along with some other areas that uh, need immediate attention, more immediate attention. Uh, but we're going to ramp things back up and get going again. So couldn't be more excited. Uh, the traveling public, I know, is going to be a direct beneficiary, and uh, we're looking forward to what we're going to accomplish. I want to thank you again this morning for your consideration of the preliminary budget. As always, I could not be prouder of the effort. And folks, our, the budget that the Turnpike Authority puts together and the level of effort that we put into it is gold standard in government, uh, as far as I'm concerned, with openness and transparency. Uh, because we tell everybody what our plan is and what our expectations are for the coming year. Uh, we put that down in writing and we tell you what we're going to try to accomplish. So uh, once again, I want to express my appreciation to the team and uh, for the work that they do to prepare that budget. Uh, and once again, I'm very proud of them. Uh, we don't ignore the fact that we are having challenges right now with everything from inflation to workforce. And we cannot ignore that. We've got to address it. We've got to craft a budget that addresses it to the best of our ability. And then most importantly, we manage that during the course of the fiscal year in a very responsible manner. Uh, when we don't do that by accident, we do it because we know that's what you expect of us. Uh, so again, I want to thank the team for their work this year and the uh, level of effort as usual that they put in uh, to preparing a very comprehensive and detailed budget. Talk a little bit, uh, and Chairman Jones, I so much appreciate your recognition of seatbelt use as a uh, really a preventative measure for fatality accidents. Uh, just as the Major pointed out, 40% of our fatality accidents are when folks are unbuckled. I want to put that in perspective. If those individuals would have been buckled in their vehicle, we might not have saved all of them. But if you just saved half, and quite frankly, it's them saving themselves, if you just reduce that 40% by half, you're talking about saving hundreds of lives in the state of Oklahoma. I can't overemphasize that. I mean, it is a true fact. And again, we need everybody in this state to stand up and say, folks, it's time to buckle up. Uh, every time you get in a vehicle, whether you're a passenger or whether you're behind the wheel, and uh, we're going to continue to call attention to that and uh, try to make a difference. <clears throat> Part of that same messaging, and uh, here we sit on another day that's going to be about 80 degrees, and uh, we're going to talk about winter weather. And <laughs> one of the things that I want to point out is we've already had some inclement weather where uh, we had some folks out that were paying attention, and uh, we're geared up and ready, and Mark is, like I said, as always, 
steadfast, ready for winter time. Uh, our crews are as ready as they can possibly be. Uh, our salt sheds are full. But the traveling public needs to know that even though it's going to be 80 degrees today, you know, a week from now it could be snowing. Uh, we just never know here in Oklahoma. And the drivers are our first line to help us be fully prepared for uh, inclement weather. And that includes everything from buckling your seatbelt to, uh, you know, we've got those posted black and white speed limit signs out there that are for a clear, bright day not for snow, rain, ice. And the first order of business is to ask everybody when you do encounter those conditions, be aware of what you're driving into and slow down. And uh, again, that can make a big difference for you. Each storm's different and our plans are different every time that we go out. Again, Mark and his team do a great job of leading that effort and making plans. Uh, we're responsible for 630 center line miles of turnpike when we go to work during inclement weather, it's 24-7 until we're done. So uh, everything else uh, gets set aside. Uh, we focus, we get busy, uh, and we don't stop until roads are clear. And we want to remind the traveling public that those operations, you know, don't stop when it stops snowing or when it stops freezing. Uh, we stay out there looking after refreeze, continuing to clear everything from main line to shoulders. And uh, so, again, we ask them to be mindful that we're still going still to be out there taking care of business, uh, even though the weather may have changed. In Oklahoma, one of the things that we are uniquely challenged with often is icing conditions. And again, we usually see a lot more icing conditions than we do snow events during the course of a year and uh, always want to caution motorists to be careful uh, and be on the lookout for those black ice conditions that we know can sneak up on you and uh, certainly slow down and allow yourself some additional travel time. Uh, if travel is necessary during uh, inclement weather, we always preach no before you go and you got several ways to do that. You can check www.okroads.org. Uh, certainly follow us on social media at OK Turnpikes. Uh, you can always call our 1-844-4-OK-HWYS or, and this is the, the best resource that we've got out there, is our mobile app, uh, Drive Oklahoma. And uh, it's available for iPhone or Android. And it always stays updated with the latest road conditions. Uh, you've got access to our, our uh, traffic operations cameras and it's a really good resource during uh, times of, of challenging driving conditions. So uh, again, just want to put a little bit of info. Here we sit in November, you know, just in advance of Thanksgiving, and, and uh, we know that it's about this time that we start to see some uh, real winter weather. Uh, Going to be an unpredictable year. We've already seen a little bit more, more wet than we might normally. Uh, so we'll see if that wet it comes in the form of uh, warmer temps and maybe less freezing or whether we just uh, have a lot of challenges this winter. We will, as we always do, hope for the best and prepare for the worst. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, appreciate the opportunity, appreciate the board's uh, attention today, and uh, certainly stand for any questions you may have. Um, I, I would add a comment with the snow and the ice conditions is just another reason to put your seatbelt on. Yes, sir. Any other questions or comments? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> that concludes our report section uh, for our monthly meeting. Um, I ask for a motion for adjournment to our next meeting scheduled for Tuesday, December 12th, 2023. So moved. Second. Second. Vote for to adjourn. We're adjourned. Thank you.